Hello, I'm Barbara Hockey, and welcome to Water is Everyone's Business. You just saw a bunch of beautiful, clean, fabulous water, didn't you? And the pictures look like they were really taken a while ago. In, the whole reason we're here is, is that we want to make sure that our water stays as clean and clear as it was years ago. And because of that, we're going to be talking a little bit about a fish, a common carp fish. And the common carp does not really too nice of things to our water. I've got an expert with me today that's going to be helping us discuss the common carp. Now, I'm from Rice Creek Watershed District. I happen to be a manager on that district. And I have a map here that I'll show you. You'll note that the watershed district is quite large. We're 186, 186 square miles. And up in the northwest corner is Anoka County. The northeast corner is Washington County. And as you come down and you see the two legs, that's actually Ramsey County. And of course, that's where we're located right now. The water runs all the way from White Bear Lake, goes north up to Forest Lakes, come back mm -hmm. down through our lakes, and goes into the Mississippi River. But from all the people that I know, and I've got a couple kids in the family that are what I call fisher people. I can't say fisherman anymore or fisherwoman. It has to be fisher people. Anyway, they love to fish. And as far as they're concerned, Rice Creek happens to be the carp capital of the world. So my guest today is Dr. Peter Sorensen, and he has a uh, research center at the University of Minnesota. What is that research center called, Peter? It's called the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species <laughs> Research Center. <laughs> And uh, we had, uh, we obtained some money from uh, the, uh, actually the Environmental Trust Fund, uh, the lottery, uh, a year ago um, to uh, uh, start to uh, uh, develop some great science uh, for the state of Minnesota uh, to, to understand some of these aquatic invasive species that are wrecking such damage to the state. To the state. Um, I looked a little bit at your biography, yeah, yeah. and I noticed one thing, you've done a lot of study, or a lot of education yeah. and everything. First of all, where were you born? Oh, I was born in Montana. Montana? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, now when I read this, you're in Montana, you even went to school in Wales, That's and correct. you did Canada. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, internet's great. I just yeah, had yeah, to I Google it and I find all this. Out. Out. Yeah. How did you end up actually at the University of Minnesota then, and how many years ago? Oh, I arrived at University of Minnesota in 1988. I had been up living in Alberta prior to that, um, working as what we call postdoc at the University of Alberta, and I just saw this job ad, uh, fisheries uh, professor needed, and uh, frankly, I applied. I never thought I'd get the job. I went on vacation, and I came back, and there it was. So uh, I came down, great state, a lot of water, a lot of interesting fish, and uh, I guess I've been here ever since. I've lived here much longer than I lived anywhere else at this point. So very now, happy to be so here. Now, what was so fascinating about carp? Because that seems to be pretty much a lot, a lot of your focus. Well, a couple things. Um, I guess starting with the obvious things. Uh, to me, um, they're an amazing animal because they are just so rugged and tough. And uh, you know, you could look at it and you could you could say, well, I despise this thing because it's caused so much damage, and and um, I don't like to eat it particularly. Or you could look at it the other way. So, well, there's an amazing creature. It's been successful all over the world, all the way. And I've done some work down the outback in Australia. They're down there. They're everywhere. So there's something really special about them, and I find that very intriguing. That's a sort of a different twist on it. I'd like to know what that is. Um, I'd like to figure it out. And then, oddly enough, Barb, uh, prior to coming to Minnesota, it's many years ago now, I was actually working on goldfish. And gold, carp are nothing but a big goldfish. And we were able to figure out quite a bit about how goldfish worked. Uh, so I came down here and said, well, now we've got these big goldfish out in the lakes. Maybe we can, it was very basic research, biomedical research. And I thought, well, we can figure out how they behave. And we were right, and I've been able to go out there and sort of verify some of this stuff. So it's probably not a bad example sometimes how basic science can come around in ways you never expect and benefit sort of applied research problems. So we, I just find them interesting all around. We have a couple pictures here <laughs> of carp. Uh -huh. And look at now, we've got two. There's Eurasian, there's Correct. the Asian. Give me the difference between what we've got here, left and right. Well, they're fundamentally different, actually. Um, the carp are in the, in the uh, group of fish called the minnows, which is well over a 1,000 species. Uh, wow. Common carp are from Eurasia. I've got that, that labeled there. And that's that, the one that looks whiter in my picture here on the right? No, no. it would be the one Eurasia. on the left. The left, um, yeah, because um, they're pretty the gold colored. olive colored um, 
fish, and below that you'll see goldfish and another relative called the Crucian carp, which we don't have in the United States, uh -huh. fortunately. Uh, but those, that group evolved in the Caspian Sea area, um, uh, Volga River, Danube River, and spread uh, from there. I think we're going to hear a little bit about that in a second. The Asian carp evolved uh, uh, in a very different spot. Um, they're separated by about 10 million years, their ancestors, in uh, Asia, uh, Vietnam, uh, China, and uh, those fish. Uh, so they're relatives, but they're sort of distant cousins, actually. And they, um, they eat plankton and things like that, and they jump, and they have there's similarities, but there are also some rather notable differences. Okay, and I've got another, I think, another picture here of carp. Yes. There we go, and this is our common carp. This, this is the is common the carp, correct. All those carp, by the way, none of them are native to the United States or, or uh, North America at all. They were all brought over, um, and they're all causing problems for different reasons. Uh, but this is the common carp, and it arrived uh, in the late 1800s. Now we have something here, yep. and here is going to be a film that's going to be shown. This film was done when our CTV 15 went into with Ramsey, Ramsey Washington Metro Correct. Watershed yep. District and Little Canada, and it tells sort of a history of it. And I thought it was quite interesting, and you will be speaking on this tape. Yep. I'm not a carp hater. I have, I have a great deal of respect for the animal. It's a minnow from Eurasia. It's a minnow that grows to be very large. In Minnesota, we've caught carp over 50 years old routinely. They're known for having high fecundity. A female can have, in Minnesota, we found up to three million eggs. It was first discovered by the Romans several thousand years ago, who uh, realized that it was a really hardy animal and partially cultured it uh, for the Roman legions and transported it across Europe. And as the Roman Empire, as it faded, the carp were left distributed widely throughout a great deal of Europe. And at about that point in time, the Catholic Church was also looking for a source of non-meat for uh, Fridays and moved it even more extensively. By the 1900s, Europe was experiencing a lot of famines and there was a large amount of immigration from Europe. The newly arriving immigrants uh, longed for the fish that they had at home. There were literally thousands of letters being written each year to members of Congress begging for carp. And they were brought over in the U.S. Uh, in the late 1870s. They were raised in reflecting pools in Washington, D.C. and distributed across the country by railroad cars for about 20 years before people started to realize this was a horrible mistake. By the late 1950s, there were carp everywhere. Water quality was bad. A lot of people believed it was carp. Nobody really knew. Nobody knew how many there were. The state government agencies were no longer interested in controlling them because nothing seemed to work. It just seemed like a pretty hopeless cause. That's kind of where we were left. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so carp, when mm -hmm. we see it and everything, um, as you said, there's a reputation for its and, and uh, rough fish, something right, that they have. Right. Now you yourself, because you handle them and you're mm -hmm. studying them, so um, have you actually eaten some of oh, them? Oh, of course, yeah, many times. They're, you have. They're just fine. Um, you know, I wouldn't say they're the best fish in the world, but they're quite edible. Uh, they're eaten many places in the world. Uh, there's markets for them. Um, they're just not a terribly valuable or I wouldn't say a gourmet kind of thing, but they're certainly edible. Uh, that's why they were brought here in the 1800s. Um, were they, uh, are they a soft fish or are they a solid meat? I've never had a carp. Oh, you never have? And well, you... they, no, no, they're fairly, um, it's a nice texture to them. Um, they're a little bit oily, so often people uh, from around here that are used to fresh, like walleye, very delicate flavor. They're a little bit stronger tasting, particularly in the summer when they've been eating in the bottom. I think probably the main strike against them is um, that they, other than the, the stronger flavors, which I don't mind particularly, is that they're kind of oily. And they're very bony, so that's also a problem. Um, you know, it's all what you're brought up with and get used to to some extent, right? Yes, exactly. So, uh, it's, exactly. Uh, yeah. When you mentioned about, uh, and we know that they're brought from somewhere else, I remember seeing that too, that way back in the middle of the 1800s, the trains would go by and they'd just drop off carp at mm -hmm. every stream and everything, and another invasive species because it's not native to the United yep. States yep. at all. 
it's a shame, I guess, in the long run. Well, but. when they arrived in uh, Minnesota, they yeah. actually came into the Central Station in St. Paul. You can look this up. And there were armed guards present because these fish were thought to be so, valuable. Be so valuable that uh, no one wanted them steal, stolen, and they were carefully stocked in Lake Como in St. Paul, actually. That was the first spot. And uh, it's amazing. <laughs> People, I don't know, uh, wish they'd listened to their uh, professors a little more or something, but readily they started distributing them everywhere, and it took quite a while to realize what a terrible mistake that was. Okay, so, now we, um, it's we got another picture of a carp here, uh -huh. and um, I think it's either that one that's going to be here, but we also yeah. have another video. And it's, uh, there we go. There we go. Now it shows, this carp is the one, the big head carp? Yes. It's, what's that do? So this is one of the Asian, so-called Asian carps. Uh, and uh, this carp, this species of carp, again, is from Asia, not from Eurasia. Uh, and it and its, its sister species, the silver carp, which is known for jumping, uh, were brought over. It's all, it's, um, as an educator, it's, it's distressing. Uh, almost, yeah. uh, almost a very similar scenario, brought over on purpose to the United States in the 1970s, introduced uh, not for, for general people, but for aquaculture. It got loose. No one thought they would do well, but frankly, this wasn't as well thought out as it should have been. It got loose in the Mississippi River, and they're now uh, spreading north. And um, this and this species and the silver carp and places now to our south, the Illinois River, they're maybe 75% of the total weight of the fish in the rivers, and they're eating everything because they are planktivorous. They filter, unlike the common carp that feeds in the bottom, common carp destroys the bottom. These guys destroy the open water. So they remove all the food, and it just turns everything into sort of chaos into a different place. Which then prevents other fish that we consider the game fish, the so plankton's gone. Right. So, it is, so some, frankly, it's a little complicated because when you change, you rearrange yes. the furniture in the rooms, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Some things will be good. Some things will be bad. It will be certainly different, distressing to people. Um, the big head carp gets well over 100 pounds, very, very large. Uh, silver carp is known for jumping, and uh, people don't like to go boating anymore and water skiing because it hits them. So it just causes havoc. I guess that's a better way to do it. And, and some, of course, some game fish will also probably suffer in the consequence, but it's just like turning your world upside down. Well, it, not only that, we've got a picture here of a um, Roshna green. We have yes. a, the green that is in one of our um, lakes that we have. This shows our chain of lakes, and you mm -hmm. see there the lake, the green lake in the very middle there. Mm -hmm. And as we go through it, you see all the other lakes. This is pretty much located in a city called Centerville near that. And uh, the other lakes are all what we consider all right, but that's been really a lot of carp. And there's another one here that shows you the bloom, the algae bloom that we get that's been happening there. And that's oh. what you're talking about, too. Now, this is pretty much all caused by the carp, by bringing up and uh, Well, there's certainly, I can't. Agitating I'm things. sure there are major contributors. So I think you may have a slide showing it. But so again, the, the, the Asian carp feed in the open water and what they're not destroying to our south, yeah. the common carp are destroying in the bottom. And the common carp don't feed in the open water. They actually feed in the bottom. And they very carefully pick out things. The thing is, they're very good at basically digging in the bottom. And they can go up to about that deep. We don't know exactly, but no native fish can do this. So these water bodies and the bottoms. They can go that deep They down. can go that deep. So it's like having pigs in your backyard just uh, digging everything up. And of course, as they do that, they release all the plants that were stabilizing the systems. They, they release uh, mud and they release phosphorus, nutrients from the bottom. So the whole place is like a boiling pot. And some places in Minnesota now, the, by our estimation, we started doing some math on it really, but they'll, they will also be over 50% by, by weight of all the fish in some of these lakes will be common carp. And of course it's been that way since the late 1800s. So people really don't, they don't have a historic memory of what they were like before, but I would say many cases people really never even knew what, what how nice Minnesota's lakes probably were because it goes back that far. But with common carp in the system, it's almost impossible to restore it because they're just ripping out the plants and ripping up the bottom. 
So there's not much you can do. You just have to get them out somehow. Oh, I know. I think we had a slide that had to indicate sort of where they're running around and you see yes. the um, sediment going up right. the water column yeah. and then it makes everything murky and mm -hmm. it creates all more problems. Um, there you this go. is the carp that are just running around. I can't believe that. Now this obviously is in a pretty shallow spot. I understand right. carp is more prevalent in shallow lakes. Is that uh, right? Not so much in the deeper lakes? They pro I, yeah, they probably are more prevalent in shallow lakes. They do particularly well in shallow lakes because they're just really robust fish. And they, um, they also do, I think in particular, and this is the most damage in shallow lakes because they can access the entire lake. And that's, uh, that, so a deeper lake is a little bit immune from carp because it's, uh, they don't want to go down deeper where there's no food and no plants. So a shallow lake, a shallow lake by, I mean, a few, few uh, maybe six to eight feet deep, no deeper than that, where normally the sunlight would be going to the bottom and there'd be plants across it. That's perfect for them. And they don't have any competitors. Once they get into these systems, they're kind of king because they live, I think I said in the video there, but it's, they actually live up to almost 70 years of age. They live to be uh, quite long lived. So once you got them, uh, you'd better be very patient because it may, you may have, your kids might be the ones that have to wait for them to die out naturally or something. So they just take over. Oh, I, the more I hear <laughs> about this, the less I like these fish. Um, we have another one that has uh -huh. um, a picture. And I know that you work on s surveying and trying to find yes, out more do. about their yeah, life and everything like do. that. So one way you do this is by you you capture the carp yep. and you hold them down yep. and you, now tell me, how do you get the carp in the first place to get that into that Well, boat? we have several ways, but one of the primary ways that probably was happening there is electrofishing. We electro, you put a, like the DNR does, we have electro, boats that put electric currents in the, in the water and just momentarily um, you know, stun uh, them. Stun them, basically. You can collect them and then mm -hmm. measure them and poke them or take a sample or whatever you want. And then yeah. after that, what you do is you are implanting. Is this one of the. Yeah, so what we're looking at here then is um, so there are a number of things we're interested in. Uh, not only how many there are, because how are you going to cure something unless you know how bad the problem is? That's the way I look at it. And, um, but we want to know how many there are. But another thing we want to know is where do they move? And the interesting thing, that's really key because what we've discovered um, is that the common carp moves great distances in very thoughtful ways. It's been quite interesting. Uh, they actually, in the Volga River where they're from, they can move actually several hundred miles in routine movements. In Minnesota, we haven't worked in a watershed. This one reason we're interested in Rice Creek watershed. Uh, but the other ones, we certainly they can move between multiple lakes. So. This is one of the things that I think has been a problem uh, for people to understand is that uh, people manage the uh, watershed. So most people, they live in a lake or a DNR manager manages it by a lake. Mm -hmm. and, but these lakes are all interconnected, as you know, and um, the carp understands that too. So they routinely, at least in the lakes we've studied to date, will swim between three or four different lakes to find the optimal place to go and they can exploit different places with throughout the entire watershed. And that meant that previous efforts to control carp were absolutely futile because everyone focused on one lake. They tried to remove them from one lake, and they could be fixed. But you know what? The carp would just come from other places. And what's particularly interesting about it, Barb, and that's one of the things we're interested in here, is they seem to know what they're doing. They're smart. They're smart. So we found that. Um, for instance, uh, some of the places we look at, um, if they, um, first off, they understand tiny connections between lakes. Uh, some of the places we've worked in, uh, people living on lakes for 20 years didn't even know that a tiny stream existed. The carp knew, and we'd find that they'd go up these places, and they'd go up them every year. And what was really interesting is they don't get lost. They would come back the same way they went in. So they're like salmon. We believe they're actually homing to known areas to them. So they're kind of been actually outsmarting us. <laughs> and this so, is your study. Yeah, this is this is yes, yeah, our work. Studying. So we've been very interested in that. You know, you mentioned something about connectivity, and yeah. um, we have a video here that I went over to my Rice Creek watershed and did this with my droid, and it's with Matt Koshin. Matt Koshin is our um, our uh, water person, and um, this video I asked him a question about that. 
Matt, how does this research at the University of Minnesota going to apply to Rice Creek Watershed District? Well, the, the University of Minnesota has done some really great research in the past couple of years uh, looking at some smaller systems, uh, but the, the research that's going on right now is really uh, moving, the, moving up in scale. The Rice Creek Watershed District, which is behind me here, uh, is a large watershed compared to watersheds where they've been working in the past, and it's very highly connected. Uh, we see lots of different lakes that are connected by Rice Creek itself. Uh, the, the creek connects Long Lake with the Chain of Lakes and Lino Lakes. Many, many different lakes that are all connected by uh, ditches and rivers. So the complexity of the system is so much that um, the research tools that the university would provide us with would help guide the management actions that we would consider doing. Now that's one video. I have another one right after talking about fish barriers because you were discussing about mm -hmm. various things and how these p fish know where, how do they always go where they are and how do you stop them? <laughs> and so we have a video here of a bar barrier t discussing. Matt, how can area. research guide management of the carp? Well, we, we have existing tools to manage carp. Um, some of the tools like uh, commercial removal of carp or fish barriers, you know, just physical barriers in a, a creek or a stream. They've been around for a long time. Uh, but because every system is different, every lake is different, every watershed is different, every carp population may be different, we really need that research to tell us how to use the existing tools in a meaningful manner. So for example, a winter removal, a large commercial removal of uh, carp may have a short-term impact, but because migration from different areas can quickly repopulate areas, uh, there's no long-term benefit. Similarly, if you put up a barrier in the wrong location, or if the barrier is ineffective, uh, or if you're operating it in, a, in an ineffective manner, uh, you're really not going to get any long-term benefit. So the management really, I hope, will guide us in how to use the tools that we have right now in a more efficient manner long-term. My goodness. Um, now, the, because of trying to control carp. We've tried a couple things. One thing is a barrier, and we mm -hmm. saw the picture that had the fish barrier up there. And the other thing that we've been trying to do is, and I know you tried this, I think, down in, uh, well, we haven't withdrawn the water like you did, I think, yeah. in the Anderson Lake area right. that's down there. Right. But this one now is something we're doing to mm -hmm. trap them, and it's mm -hmm. at Long Lake, and mm -hmm. we've been doing some. Right. Yes, in the wind. You said how they like to home in. So tell me a little bit about what they do and how can we get them in the winter time and how do they get into one spot? Ah, well, that's one of the reasons I'm interested in this system. So I strongly suspect most of these carp are coming from other places in the watershed, actually, probably well upstream, uh, which is critical to understand because uh, and you're just looking at a symptom here, not the cause. So we have to understand how they move back and forth. And once you understand it, and it's quite optimistic because if they're following these really thoughtful, kind of purposeful, directed movements, then we can very carefully and strategically place a barrier in those particular spots. We just don't have to place them randomly. So uh, anyway, we have to understand how they move. Uh, we have to understand how many there are. Like, is that 10% of the population or 50%? Does the fisherman go back? you know, time and time again, or do you just get most of them? And then really importantly, we haven't talked about it, but that's another part of it. We have to figure out where the young are coming from, the source of the problem, because a female can have up to three million eggs every year, and if she can live to be 50, which is not unreasonable for a carp, you can do the math, that's hundreds of millions of eggs. It's an endless supply, it's like having a leaking boat. So you gotta plug the hole and then kind of fix it. So we're after that whole suite of things, but right now uh, we're particularly interested in our research in Rice Creek and just looking at the movement patterns because most of these movements are also associated with spawning and reproductions. So we gotta find those hot spots where they, where they reproduce. You gotta put it all together. Basically. I'm so glad you're doing the research. <laughs> well, so are we. It's, been, oh, it's a lot of fun. I am so happy. I think it'll be useful. You know, what you just saw, the fish that were being taken yeah. out of in the wintertime, and they hone all in in, this, mm -hmm. in one spot, that was relieving, That was taking out approximately 180,000 right. right. pounds of carp, and that was in two winters, the winter of 2010, right. 2011, and that's pr approximately 36,000 fish each year 
and that's enough to fill the Twins no. Stadium. <laughs> I think you probably have seen I've that seen before. That, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm very happy that you've gotten whatever it is that the grant you have, and I believe that you're the person in the nation that's the CARP expert now, aren't you? Uh, well, for common, yeah, maybe. Uh, we're certainly one of the very few groups uh, working on this. Um, I got to say, we've been fortunate in the state of Minnesota to have so much great support from so many places because we can't do it all by ourselves. And uh, I think, uh, just a little plug, but I, this is the only way forward because you're just not going to solve this problem by removing them or putting a barrier up. You've got to figure out the whole thing. And then, uh, I can tell you in some watersheds we've already had some great successes because we've already found, for instance, sometimes all the carp are coming from one lake, not all the lakes. Uh, you've, there's surprising insights that, that come through understanding and, uh, you know, 150 years of not knowing what you're doing for me is enough. <laughs> oh, it is. It's time to figure out what it is we're trying to do here and then be smart about it, use our resources effectively. Certainly is. Well, I am uh -huh. so glad. As I've said, I've been to yeah. DNR seminars and like that, and people were saying, you, Peter Sorensen, have well, to be the one that kind. becomes the person that does this because <laughs> we've got it right here and everybody can get the answer. I really wish you, all of you, the best of well, luck you. in what you're doing. <laughs> and I know you work with students. Oh, yeah, a lot everything. of great students in my lab. It's been a great yeah. team. It's a team effort. You did. And <laughs> so that's really great. So I want to thank you very, very much and um, to the viewers and everything. But everybody, if you ever catch a carp, never put it back in the water. <laughs> Keep it out. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. You're welcome. Thank Appreciate you for having you doing me. That. Yeah. My pleasure. I can't believe how quickly that it, went like nothing. <laughs> yeah, but it went so very, very fast. Good. So that we have it. Um, but.